Hey everyone, it's Dr. Rick with Herbal 411. Aaron requested a video on acne. And that's a very broad topic. And I was hemming and hawing about, oh, that's a lot to talk about. So I decided I'm going to break this down over this week, the 7th of February, and do a couple of different videos, all based on kind of the same root cause. But with Aaron being 39 and having acne all her life, and owning a company 50 to 60 hours a week, and having a little bit of stress from teenage years, I think it's very important to see how this acne might be a check engine light for other things. You would normally think, oh, I got a pimple. I'm stressed out. I'm not eating right and I'm not sleeping right. So just fix those things and it'll go away. But it doesn't. I had cystic acne and it was terrible. My self-esteem was poor. Imagine being a bodybuilder, investing all that stuff, but having to cover it up all the time because of terrible back acne. And every time I take my shirt off, people would come up and say, hey, what's going on with your skin? Or what's on your back? Yet it wasn't just acne. It was cystic and it looked terrible. I think that there should be more than just antibiotics you put on, vitamin A you put on, or antibiotics you eat, or vitamin A that you eat. So those of you who have acne, you'll probably hear about something called Accutane. That's the top of the heap. It's pretty aggressive. Accutane is a form of vitamin A. Be taking this on your own. In fact, take this information to your doctor and see how it pertains to you. This is only educational. Sometimes we'll have several different layers of entry before going to Accutane because it's so aggressive, you just have to get through the months of being on that medicine and all the side effects. It is known that if you're on that medicine, you have to be on birth control because it's teratogenic, meaning it will cause damage to your baby. Or oral antibiotics are not treating the root cause. And I'm gonna try to present Aaron in a way that you might see where my destination will be. So everybody's profile is a little different, but Aaron's might pertain to you. So consider sharing this, taking some notes, and bring it to your doctor's office. Let's get into the timeline and you'll see where I'm going with so it. Aaron had issues when she was a teenager. Teenagers will usually have acne because of the pulses and hormones. As you go from infancy to childhood to teenage years, male or female, you'll have this surge of testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. And that's male or female. But as you get older, especially with massive changes in hormones, you can have terrible acne, meaning cystic acne like I had when I was a kid. So it's important to give you an idea about what do you notice, when to pull the trigger, when to actually ask a dermatologist or your primary care doctor for help. Everybody's a little different. And some people are very gifted that they don't have acne. I'd say about 15% of the population will have it. It can be to the point of having some anxiety develop around it, bashfulness, apprehension, difficulty with uh, public speaking, all because of the look, because you're different. The pulse surges that teenagers have, you can't avoid unless you give them birth control. In some cases with young teens, there's going to be a surge with all males and females. Females in particular have surges and waves, so they'll go up and down depending on the periods. Men, you'll see facial hair, you'll see the muscles grow, and that hallmarks puberty. Acne usually hallmarks puberty as well because of the same pulse. When there's a pulse in hormones, there will also be a change in oil. In some cases, the basics are that when you have a change in oil, if this is your skin and this is your poor and this is a hair you'll also have sweat glands and sebum glands or oil glands to take care of the condition of the skin and the hair because you're supposed to slough off dead debris it's supposed to leave when you pulse your hormones the dead debris will accelerate and you'll have it block the pore when it blocks the pore you will have, this is a spoiler, you will have a whole bunch of bacteria just love the oil that's there, love the anaerobic state, and then they'll blossom into inflammation. When you have inflammation, you've got this pustule that starts, and that's the beginning of the pus pocket or the cystic acne. That's how hormones change. And it also pertains to food too, which we'll get to in a second. If you don't have a pulsed hormone and you go through it very smoothly, what can happen is as you get older and you get exposed to crappy food, standard American diet, high carbs, a lot of processed foods, and a lot of chemicals or hormones. And I'm not going to get into this with regards to cow milk, but what do we do when we're kids? We're pushed milk, cheese. I just think that those dairy products that I used to take when I was a kid are really damaging a lot of people. Again, 15% doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're one of the 15% and you go through life trying to shape yourself, every person counts, but when one person is off, it's my job to get them back online into a proper direction, less acne, 
more steam. The same thing can happen even if you don't have a pulsed hormone as far as food. So if you're lucky enough that you don't have too rocky a hormone surge when you're going through your teenage years or as you hit menopause, if you indulge in bad food, you'll see acne flare up. A lot of people will notice diarrhea with certain beers, wines, eating a pizza with a lot of Swiss cheese. Food can really affect the way the skin behaves. The skin is an organ in itself. And so is the GI tract, which we'll talk about in a second but it's just a manifestation of something going on inside. And it's usually gonna be a food intolerance or an exposure to the hormones in the food or the proteins in the food, especially dairy. So sorry, dairy, if you have acne, you really should consider that if it pertains to you as far as staying away from certain foods. If food does have any link to acne, when the pulsed surges occur, especially in teenage years, you have to be good about the foods that you eat so that you keep the breakouts low. So the other thing that happened with Erin is that she went through a colonic resection. Now, when you have a foot of your colon, which is three feet long, a foot taken out, that is usually the home for the microbiota. And microbiota is just a term that talks about the different bacteria in your gut that exist to serve you. When you take away the home, there's no bacteria and you need good bacteria to do all the processes of enzymes and sleep and repair and immune support. As a physician, I know that when my surgery colleagues cut anything out of the bowel, you usually have to load a ton of antibiotics into the patient beforehand to kill everything. But you also sacrifice your microbiota with certain bacteria that exist in your gut. And there's a different studies that say there's 200, there's 4,000. There's a lot of bacteria. Uh, it's still evolving as far as the studies. A lot of these studies that you find with microbiota are in vitro because it's hard to reproduce and grow out stuff in your gut, especially because you take the bacteria in your poop and you put it on a culture medium and you hopefully grow out, but there's other bacteria that can't grow out into a culture medium that we don't know about. So it's important, bottom line, that to, to realize that there's a lot of good bacteria in your gut, and when you take antibiotics, you will destroy some of them. The data shows that it can be repaired between, say, antibiotics like amoxicillin or antibiotics like z -Pak. Yeah, Those of you who have taken z -Pak, z pak destroys the most. It's just a broad-spectrum antibiotic, and it'll kill anything in your chest, even for COVID. I've used it a couple of times in my COVID clinic, anything in the nose, anything in the urine, uh, so there's a lot of good benefits for knocking out an infection, but you will destroy your microbiota. If the bacteria here, the population is strong enough, they'll recover after the antibiotics. The microbiota you have, the profile you have existing in you, recovers a bit, builds up, and then maintains itself. If you hit with antibiotics, more antibiotics and more antibiotics, back to back to back, you will slowly dwindle the microbiota to just a few and they will not be able to do the job that the entire population did. One or two or three bacterias or yeasts or protozoa will start to blossom. That leads to protozoal infections, it leads to candidiasis and other things that totally throw off and cause inflammation in the gut. So bottom line here, spoiler, when you have inflammation in the gut lining, meaning diarrhea, bloating, uh, upset stomach, reflux, the gut lining is just a different form of skin. So the gut lining will reflect as bad, irritated, and painful. The skin will reflect, not as painful, but the skin will reflect as acne, eczema, psoriasis. So I, I actually had a guy came in. He was just ichthyosis. He was dry everywhere. I was wondering, what the heck is going on with this guy? There are things called ichthyosis patients that, that ha don't have any sebum. Genetically, they're, they're missing some oil. But in many cases, it's usually going to be the same issues as the gut here. So we'll go back to Erin's case. Regardless, she had the resection. I know she had antibiotics before the resection. Now, post-resection, which uh, happened when she was 30, she's now 39, she probably doesn't have any more exposure to the antibiotics. I'm sure she's finished with seeing the surgeon. But you're missing a third of the house that the microbiota is supposed to hang out with. So that leads to problems of absorption of vitamins because the gut is important. All three feet of the colon is important. The other 25 feet of the small intestine, all important. And when you're missing something, something's gonna be deficient. It's usually gonna be some vitamin. And then the vitamins lead to other problems down the line. Oh, she also had pregnancy times three. Uh, she didn't tell me whether it was a C-section 
or vaginal delivery, but it's important to understand this, that has a baby comes from a theoretically sterile environment in your tummy, there's no bacteria, theoretically. But I've seen some studies that have taken fluid out of the baby's amniotic uh, pocket and cultured it. And there are a couple of bacteria that get transferred from mom in utero. But bottom line is, when you have a baby C-section, there's no exposure to the vaginal flora. So the baby's first exposure to uh, gut microbiota to seed or inoculate them comes from the vagina because there's good bacteria in the vagina. If you're well balanced, as the baby comes out, which usually the baby will, as the baby comes down, will uh, imbibe the bacteria and that'll be the first inoculation. And then from then on, you'll also have breastfeeding which will be a second bacteria. Usually it's lactobacilli as far as a species in the vagina and bifidobacter that's on the breast. But those two exposures inoculate the baby. You know, those are the best probiotics you can give to any baby. It's important to understand that when you have the pregnancy, there could have been damage. We have to get information on whether a C-section was there or vaginal. We have to get information on if the, during pregnancy there was antibiotics used. And that kind of changes around the profile of what the baby gets inoculated with as far as mouth and gut. Aaron has been on oral contraceptives. I think, I didn't get all the details, but I think it was to control her irregular periods. And that's since she was 20, I believe. And then she was on an IUD, intrauterine device, to stop pregnancy that had hormones in it. So she had hormones from when she was a kid, probably polycystic ovarian syndrome, I'm assuming, and then hormones uh, as she's an adult. Hormones will cause that pulse thing. Typically, if you get hormones, that's one of the answers that gynecologists will do, is if you have a patient not pregnant, but just with acne, and they want uh, protection to not get pregnant, the hormones that they use will control the brain and the ovary talking, and it'll bring down the pulses. So you don't get pregnant, but you also can control some of the sebum and some of the bad side effects from the pulsed hormones of teenage years or menopause or menopause. Bottom line is that when you have hormones, it gives you a temporary response to bring down the cause of uh, imbalance. However, you're going to have to get off the hormones sooner or later. And there's other things with cancer and hormones, but we'll talk about that later on in the week. Has she delivered? She noticed a flare up all three times with her acne. When she was pregnant, limited acne. And it's because there was no pulse. You get it? So when you're pregnant, you don't have a period. The corpus luteum just continues to take care of feeding the baby hormones and having the baby grow in utero. So there's no pulse anymore, it's just growth. And that brings down the pulses, thus the changes in oil and other things. So you can fake that out by giving yourself oral contraceptives or an IUD, but again, you're gonna to have to stop that eventually. So already we know cause, hormone, maybe the cause, loss of microbiota, maybe loss of the home. The other problem that dovetails all this stuff is food. And I think this is the biggest problem. My, my interpretation is that a lot of the acne comes from here. It's just an expression of what's going on internally. In medical field, there was the human microbiome project that was started about a decade ago and finished. I thought it was gonna be great, but nobody really listens to it as far as my colleagues. There are some doctors, naturopaths, that really embrace the changing of the microbiome and the diet. And, uh, and by default, uh, Aaron was able to change her acne by getting on a ketogenic diet. So that's not for everybody, but what happens when you get on a ketogenic diet is it's low carbohydrate, low fiber. And I've done videos on ketogenic diet before, so I'll see if I can put some links down below. But the, it's nice because it gives your gut a break. It's almost like an elimination diet. Those of you who have acne and tried to fend for yourself or you didn't want antibiotics, when you eliminate bad things, there's something called the Sinister 7, and I'll list them down below. But the Sinister 7, when you go on a, a restriction diet, elimination diet, just cut down to the basics uh, to see and give the gut a break or the skin a break, you will cut out a lot of crap and a lot of those crappy foods cause an inflammatory reaction. Acne is inflammation. Whether you see the inflammation on your face or you feel the inflammation on your gut, that's due to food and alcohol and sugar and unfortunately wheat. You don't have to be gluten intolerant to have a problem with wheat. It's like saying, do you have to be allergic to gasoline to drink gasoline safely? No, it's gonna be caustic for everybody. So who cares about the allergic response and the same thing with gluten. When you have gluten or any toxic food to you, what happens is the gut reacts to it 
and it increases or cuts out the zonulin fibers. Zonulin is when you have a cell and another cell in the lining of the gut, zonulin keeps the pore closed and it opens to let in nutrient, but it closes to keep bacteria, fungus, and protozoa out. But sometimes when you expose your gut or your lining to bad stuff, gluten, wheat, mercury, uh, protozoa, it can irritate this thing and open the gate. When it opens the gate, everything gets through into the bloodstream. And when it gets through into the bloodstream, the immune system reacts to destroy. And uh, that is when the gut starts to have bloating, swelling. That's when you get uh, weight gain because of the ingredients in your food or your meal that are getting through and causing a temporary leaky gut or a permanent leaky gut. And I'll, I, again, I'll talk about it. They don't have time today, but I'll talk about it in the videos this week. But uh, sometimes when you destroy zonulin or you know you can destroy it, you also know that you can heal it. And how do you heal it? Well, getting on a restrictive diet. So keto is a restrictive diet. It's not for everybody, like I said, and it can be manifested. I actually uh, was on a carnivore diet and I did fine with it. Actually, I felt great. And I also had muscle that grew and fat that burned, but uh, maintaining it's tough. Well, but in some cases, when you introduce keto or fat to your diet, some people won't do well and they'll really blow up. So you have to have a nutritionist, registered dietitian, or a physician that knows nutrition help guide you. So don't do it yourself. Uh, please seek out the help. And she switched from keto to low carbohydrate, which is just a little bit more allowance of carbs than the strict ketogenic diet. Now she's a pescatarian. So there's, she's, she's shaping her diet. And one thing I have to note, Aaron, I, I think you mentioned in your note that you introduced wheat and sugar back into your diet. And I'm like, you shouldn't because there's so many other substitutes. Number one, you shouldn't be doing sugar. We should not be doing sugar. I know it tastes good, but don't do that because it makes you want more sugar and it causes an inflammatory reaction. There's something called a glycemic index or glycemic load. And when the glycemic index is high on a food product, this comes out of ratings from Canada. When a glycemic index is high, you pulse insulin. And when you pulse insulin, it causes the same changes as the hormones. So, you can have hormonal changes of pulses, whether it's teenage years or adult years, and that'll cause or bring out acne. You can also have the same thing with crappy food, high glycemic index foods. That's why you want to go low glycemic index, healthy foods. The lower the glycemic index, the slower the food gets absorbed, and the slower and lower the insulin gets pulsed. So this is healthy food. Uh, the meal also has to be considered. So I think I have a video on glycemic index or glycemic load, and I'll again put the link down below. Uh, but I just would not do sugar. I don't think we need that. We have too much sugar. Uh, and it's not just white sugar, it's sugar embedded in everything. Uh, it's very tempting to do it because there's a reward that you get when you have sugar, but the downsides and collateral damage aren't worth it. And as far as wheat, you don't have to have an allergy or an intolerance to gluten. I think that gluten, especially in large volumes, will cause that leaky gut issue with everybody. And when it does, that's a trigger for inflammation in the gut, that's a trigger for inflammation in the face. There's so many wheat substitutes that you can get uh, gluten-free, and that's the biggest issue with wheat is the gluten it contains. Uh, you can get gluten-free, but you have to do a lot of reading and label reading and, and tracking of your macros. But Erin said that she stayed away from gluten for four weeks and she didn't notice anything, so she went back. But I will tell you, it takes a lot of time. In some of my thyroid patients, I'll say go gluten-free for four months because it sometimes takes that amount of time. You should see an improvement, but if the acne is multifactorial or pulling one lever, might not give you the best reaction, but don't throw that out. I would stay continue with gluten-free, start loading up a couple other things, and you'll see everything come together. It's just that when you apply a whole bunch of changes at the same time, that's stressful. And she's already working 50 to 60 hours a week, so I don't want to do that to her, and she has a little bit of anxiety, so that's where I would probably focus more. I think patients can control their food, but they have to understand what they're trying to control and the end result so that they stay invested. Motivation's tough. When you're doing, when you're leaving the office on Friday night and it's dark and everybody else is gone and it's like, wait, everybody's partying. I'm still doing my work. It's very frustrating. And that plays into cortisol, plays into hormones. 
and without taking any hormones, if you screw up your hormones because you're totally stressed out, then you turn on the insulin response, you decrease your ovarian hormones or testicular hormones, and you already cause the imbalance. So I question whether Erin had anxiety because of her problem in the gut or food allergies, or she had anxiety from uh, some other traumatic event when she was growing up. But even if your gut is beautiful and it's perfect, you poop every day and everybody should poop every day. Having constipation or pooping once a week is just a no-no because you reabsorb all that crap that the gut's trying to get rid of. You can't force yourself to poop, but typically low motility in the digestive system is because of lack of certain bacteria. Uh, I'll talk about that later, so I don't want to, I don't want to make this an hour long video. So I'm just giving Aaron some ideas. Please subscribe like I talked to you about, and you'll see when I do the other videos. Let's talk about some of the options. If we figure out, going back to the pulsed issue when she was a teenager, figure out what the food diary was back then, it would help me. Figure out if she needed antibiotics and how many times she needed them, it would help me. And then the trauma, like I talked about, if there is a trauma, the brain can affect the way the gut works and the gut can affect the way the brain works. So there's a feedback loop uh, and it goes back and forth. It, it's not an independent organ that just works on absorbing and uh, putting out fuel sources. There's more hormones in here. There's actually more DNA in your gut, foreign DNA than natural DNA because of all the bacteria we keep. But we have this ancestral footprint or microbiota that has been handed down in humanity and it's evolving, but it's evolving in the wrong way because of the, the gut diversity is really narrowing down. And a lot of these bacteria are important for keeping you slim, having you wake up, calming the brain, rebuilding muscle, uh, maturing properly, uh, making cholesterol less sticky. All these things are really important, but sometimes we neglect them. And so that's the compartmentalization of Western medicine is one doctor takes care of one thing, another doctor takes care of another thing, and nobody wants to go to a lot of doctors. So I'll, again, I'll talk to you about it next time. So bottom line here, if this is the case, I would like to get more data. And then the, again, the spoiler would be, I would rebuild the hormonal feedback loop. Try to rebuild it. If, the, if I have a teenager, I try to see if there's an abnormality. I can use prescriptions because I'm a physician and we can use that as band-aids temporarily while we fix everything else. But again, during those very important years, it's imperative to stabilize because they're growing and um, interactions are very important to shape the mind and the personality. And when you're hit with a trauma, it stops the development and you kind of go askew. You might not develop like everybody else whether it's the gut, the mood, or maturity. So I would try to fix the hormonal feedback, either temporarily or with exercise, food, or uh, counseling. I think it's very important. As far as the damage that we had from the colon resection and the antibiotics back then, when the antibiotics are given, you destroy everything. It's like a nuclear bomb on a town. But sometimes the most fastidious bacteria, protozoa or fungus, will continue to live. That's C. diff. That could be pathogenic bacteria. So I'd like to see what her bacterial profile looks like, her microbiota profile. And so I have a Genoa account that I'm going to be talking about as far as a poop test. Not the standard poop test that most doctors do for looking for parasites and protozoas and fungi, but a poop test to look and see what your majority of bacteria grow out as, the good bacteria. If you can get a profile of three different groups of bacteria, you can see where you might want to feed the groups to have them blossom. And yes, food will support a microbiota that's healthy, but you have to have the right food. With ketogenic diets, mostly meat and fat, you don't have much fiber. And fiber feeds microbiota. Different fibers, different vegetables, different plants, seeds, nuts, legumes, they all feed different bacteria. So if you have an army with different specialties, uh, mechanics, shooters, flyers, uh, tank drivers. You have to give each of those specialties a different set of skills and a different set of food, and so at least for the bacteria. So every fiber feeds a different bacteria, and that's how you can blossom your bacteria, your, your microbiota properly. So it can be rebuilt, but you gotta make sure that you don't have any bad guys. There's also other things that support the good bacteria, herbals I'll talk about. Garlic, trifala, clove, berberine, another herb I've done a video on. Uh, they all will help feed the bacteria so it can reshape it and support it. 
And the cool thing about uh, garlic extract is that it usually feeds good guys and it doesn't feed bad guys. So that's your antibiotic herb. And you, but you have to be careful because some people will respond in the wrong way to certain antibiotic herbs. So that's why, again, I wouldn't do this on your own. I, you have to take this to your doctor. Moving back to hormones, I think there's ways to use Band-Aids if we have to, just to give the person a psychological break. Or while you're working to build the gut up, use, if you can control hormonal pulses, whether older or younger, it would be important to fix what we're trying to fix and control those other levers that cause acne. Finally, there is something called a fecal microbiota transplant. It sounds weird, but this is what happens. In many studies, especially with obesity, you can take animal studies where you give a mouse that is sterile the bacteria or the poop from a mouse that's unhealthy and fat, and you give it to the sterile mouse, and the sterile mouse becomes unhealthy and fat. You can also take the poop from a very healthy mouse, skinny and muscular and quick to think, and you give that to the sterile mouse, and that sterile mouse becomes skinny, muscular, and quick to think. So there's great evidence in animal studies that shows if you fix the microbiota, great. But if you transplant the microbiota, then you have a jump start. I'm working with a GI group in Illinois. I'm trying to coax them into taking my patients for fecal microbiota transplant, FMT. At this point in time, the FMT is done by colonoscopy. You have to have a colonoscopy, look inside, just look for damage. And then as the colonoscopist, the GI person or the infectious disease guy or gal pulls out the scope, they leave the bacteria, the fecal transplant from the healthy human being. It sounds weird, but we actually have donors that are very healthy that are willing to donate their poop so that you can have their poop. In the case of C. difficile, which is a very bad disease that kills due to over-prescribing antibiotics, you'll have the patient resolve the symptoms of C. difficile quickly, within days, I've heard. So that's what pays for the procedure. At this point in time, it might not pay for the procedures of FMT if you just have dysbiosis or if you have acne. But I'm gonna to try to talk my GI specialist into taking my patients. So watch the videos that I'm gonna put out this week because it'll include that. If I can get, say, my eczema patients or psoriasis patients or rheumatoid arthritis or autoimmune disease, SLE, if we give them, or just same stand, standard stuff, SIBO uh, or I, IBS, IBD, if I can give them the opportunity to have an FMT and their symptoms go away, screw just using it for C. diff. I can use it for everything else. And again, that's a Band-Aid, but it's hard to do all this stuff and hard to stay engaged and sometimes that is a fast way to have relief. And then you can't obviously have FMTs all the time, but at least if you get a little bit of relief, you can implement and deploy these other options. That is where I'm gonna leave this, Aaron. So hopefully this gives you a couple of good ideas. Please watch the rest of the videos for the week. How to control hormonal pulses, how to maybe manipulate diets so you have less sebum or the right amount of oils. And, and I'll, I'll just say this, there's total imbalance between omega-3 and omega-6 or barrage oil or gamma linolenic. There's importance in essential fatty acids. And if we do a standard American diet, you're not getting anything out of that. This is my steak, egg, and cheese bagel that I have from 2011, and it's still alive. And I used to eat these when I was working for Central DuPage Hospital. I think I'd eat one to two every morning, and it was really yummy and rewarding. And I'd have 10 packs of sugar in the McDonald's coffee, large, every morning. And I thought I was bulletproof. I wasn't bulletproof. I mean, I eventually went on to severe IBS. I actually had C. diff. And I thought it was because of this, coffee, alcohol, bad living. A lot of the foods that are out there aren't really foods. They don't have the chemical structure of whole food and they have a lot of chemicals in them that cause problems that we're talking about. So what you eat will really affect how you live. It's important to understand how to go or navigate what to eat. And it's very confusing because food companies will do as much as they can to hide stuff and make it taste the same, but it's not the same. And if we lose all our older patients or grandpops and grandmoms, if we lose everybody that has a talent to pass down how to cook and nobody younger wants to learn because they have no time, you're gonna be a prisoner to delivery. And it might seem like you open the door, pay the driver, get your food and you're, got, you're done, but 
you're assuming that the person that prepared the food used good ingredients. That doesn't always happen. And because you have to, as a cook, you have to save money. So you use low level ingredients that might taste about the same, or you'll put in other spices. That's fine. But if you put in other chemicals to make the food last and give the, the person that's eating the food a little bit of a high, that's not fair, but that's what we're exposed to, especially with COVID. And I don't, I just fear what's going to happen with the next generation. If they lose the talent of knowing how to cook and knowing how to take care of things. And it's where medicine has gone now. I, I love what I do. And I have seen a lot of great turnarounds with using medicines, but we don't really address the root cause as physicians. And, um, it, it's a, it's a shame now that that's not, that's a general statement. That's 30,000 foot view. But again, that's the way I feel. So Aaron, hopefully this gives you a couple of ideas. Please watch and subscribe, like I mentioned. Otherwise, thanks for watching up until this point. I'll put down my links uh, down below, but please put some comments on what you have done. And maybe if you've used a natural dermatologist that does buy into this, we can share our dermatologists, at least the ones that are good, uh, with everybody else. So thanks for watching. I'll see you at the next video.